Well, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome everyone. Um, as always, the meeting is being recorded. And it's a pleasure to introduce Ilka Agricola, who will speak on generalizations of three Sasakian manifolds and skew court torsion. Okay, yeah, thank you, Caroline. And thank you all three, Caroline, Rami, and uh, Emilio, for setting up this nice seminar and for, well, inviting me and listening whatever time of the day it might be in your time zone. Okay, so for us, it's just after lunch and a good moment to do math after coffee again. So I invite you to this long-term project that I've been working on together with Julia Di Leo from Bari and my PhD student, Leander Stecker, in the past years. And uh, so you may know some of you, some of the first material, but I added last touches and some outlook to more recent material for at the end of the talk in the hope that um, there will be something for everybody. Okay. And I will try not to forget to pause once in a while uh, in such a way that uh, you can ask questions. I do not see some kind of chat. So I guess you will just have to switch on your microphone and yell if something's wrong. Okay. So here we go. So let's look a little bit back into history. Sasaki manifolds were introduced by the Japanese mathematician Sasaki uh, around 1960. And then quite quickly, the notion of three Sasakian manifolds emerged, which has actually quite several different accesses. So the quick definition of a three Sasakian manifold, these are always going to have dimension four and plus three is that that's a Riemannian manifold such that the metric cone has holonomy inside SPN plus one, if you make the numbers match in the right way, which just means that it's required to be hypercalar. Then some first results were uh, obtained rather quickly. For example, we know that the odd Betting numbers up to middle dimension are divisible by four. The structure group is SPN times identity. It has to be a spin manifold. They're always Einstein. Of course, they're deeply related to the quaternionic hop vibration and more generally to quaternionic Kähler manifolds, which we're going to see again at the end. Um, in all these dimensions, the condition to be free Sasakian is in fact equivalent to admitting free killing spinners. And of course, there are many examples known, and in particular, there's a classification of the homogeneous case by Boyer, Galitsky, Mann. Now, if we think back to our classical courses on differential geometry, geometry, then the first thing to notice is that Zazaki and free Zazaki manifolds, and in fact, all of contact geometry, um, does not appear in Berger's holonomy theorem, meaning that the levi civita connection is not acting irreducibly with an interesting subgroup of the orthogonal group on the tangent bundle. So in fact, the levi civita connection is not very well adapting for an investigating Riemannian contact manifolds. And if I'm saying contact, basically it always means always contact manifold definitions are going to follow. It's just a question of abbreviations. Okay. Ilka, yes. Before you proceed, could you please explain a little more about the relation with the quaternion half vibration? Uh, well, S7 is the standard example of a Frizazaki manifold, right? So if um, you... Um, what are the three killing spinners, those from coming from S3, I guess? No, no, this you can't see. No, no, it's not like they're coming from the base or something. No, this is not working. Um, the killing, the, the spin representation on a seven dimensional manifold is a priori a complex eight dimensional representation. Here, in fact, it's a real representation. So it can also take eight dimensional real. And the three killing spinners, it's better to look at them from watching a seven as unit length spinner fields. And then you see relatively quickly that you have it. Or the other way to do is, you know, the rep representation of all dimensional spheres as Berger manifolds, right? As Berger spheres, you have to take the Berger metric. And then obviously you have once a trivial representation in the isotropy representation, that's a killing vector field. And that's where you get the S3 acting. Is that more or less? Okay, okay, thank you. But, but you know, it's not like you can see it intuitively immediately. 
that's not possible. Okay, so what do we want to do? Um, we want to define and investigate a new class of manifolds, uh, which in, uh, with, with, with two things in mind. So in one way, we want to catch geometric quantities or quantum geometric properties, which are going to describe the relative position of free almost contact structures. And the class should not be so general that you can't say anything reasonable about it, but it should in particular be restrictive enough to admit a good metric connection with skewed torsion because we know by now that, well, metric connection obviously because it's a Riemannian manifold and skewed torsion has turned out to be very suitable for studying such geometries uh, like in G2 geometry, uh, nearly Kähler manifolds and many other examples, okay? So in order to do so, one can introduce in more general terms for any free almost contact manifolds, things that are called a rib commutator function, a rib killing function. We're going to see that in, only in examples. Then we are going to define this new class of manifolds, which we call free alpha delta Zazaki manifolds. They just generalize free alpha Zazaki manifolds by allowing an additional second parameter delta. Okay, and how free Zazaki fits into the picture will become clear. We introduce a notion of phi compatible connections where phi will be explained. It's basically one almost contact structure in the sphere of structures which comes with the manifold. Now this is a large class of connections. And so we want at the end to have a unique connection. So that's going to be introduced with a certain extra condition I'm going to explain. And then we have a canonical connection. And then you, you, you play your machinery and see what you get. So you can compute the torsion, you study the holonomy, the curvature of this connection. It gives us lots of new examples. I will classify under certain assumptions the homogeneous ones. I will try to give an outlook to further applications. And because the slide was full, I'm not mentioning, but it will also have um, some outlook to uh, strongly positive curvature. Okay, so all these things we want to look at. Um, there is this very long paper by Julia DiLeo and mine where the details are given and for, with each talk we give on the topic, we cut out details, okay? Um, so all the things I'm going to say have more general versions, but these I would like you to just check in the paper. That makes more sense than giving you all the technicalities here. Okay, if there are going to be enough formulas that way anyway. So let's start with an odd dimensional almost contact metric manifold. In particular, that means that on the tangent bundle, we have a preferred direction. We have the rib vector field. Eta is the one form due to it. And on the orthogonal complement of the rib vector field, we have a almost complex structure phi, which is compatible with G in the usual way. Then it is known the structure group is reducible to U on one times identity. You can define a fundamental form, which is basically the fundamental form of the almost complex structure phi here. Okay, and it's zero by definition on the refactor field. And then you can define it to be normal, which would just be the integrability condition, basically on the cone, right? The cone is going to have even dimension. And there's a particular property, namely this is going to be called alpha Zazaki. And if there's a non-vanishing real constant alpha, such that d eta is actually two alpha times phi phi being the fundamental truth from the above. Okay, so the eta and phi are just the same. And it has to be integrable, so vanishing um, Neuenhaus tensor, if we want to call it like that. And in fact, these two conditions together will imply that the vector field is a killing vector field. And here and all the time afterwards, Zazakian always corresponds to the choice alpha equal to one. Now, if you haven't seen alpha Zazaki manifolds before, the Zazaki condition, so if you fix alpha to be one, then you realize if you rescale your metric even by a constant, not even um, a conformal change of metric, but really a constant, then you realize that the Zazaki condition is not invariant. But you pick up a constant and this is just exactly this alpha. 
Okay, so the geometric meaning of alpha is not very deep. It basically allows you to rescale the whole metric as you like. Okay, so these are almost contact metric manifolds and as a special case of particular interest, the Zaki manifolds. Now, a little survey of what is known about metric connections with skewed torsion and what we mean by that. So I start with a Riemannian manifold and um, I pick a G structure on it. Okay, so all my manifolds are orientable anyway, so G is in fact a subgroup of S O N. Then I would like to replace the Levitsch Vita connection, Nabla G, by a metric connection with torsion that is going to be compatible with the geometric structure. So for me, the first thing which may be unusual is that for me, the torsion is a free zero tensor and not a two one tensor. I just contract once with the metric, which is possible because I have it. Okay. And if I do so, then of course, a special case would be that this torsion is not only a free zero tensor, but totally anti-symmetric. It's anti-symmetric in X and Y, but in general, there are no symmetry properties with respect to Z. So a particular case is to require that T is a free form. Actually, if you look at the condition, then you will see quickly that this means that the geodesics are exactly the same as of the levitsch vita connection. And then the torsion is just half of the difference tensor um, between the levitsch vita and the new connection. So in short, if you have a metric connection, and then the new connection is Levitsch Vita plus one half the torsion. And I just write it like that. Because I contracted with Z, I have to take the scalar product with Z here as well. Now, if such a connection, metric connection with Q torsion exists, preserving the geometric structure, then, and is unique, then this is called a characteristic connection. And the first observation by Friedrich Ivanov is that on almost contact metric manifolds, we can formulate very easily a criterion when such a connection is going to exist. Namely, if you look here, an almost contact metric manifold it's a unique metric connection with skewed torsion. So what, what does it mean to preserve the geometric structure in that situation? Well, I want that the ray vector field and one form are parallel and the fundamental form phi of the almost compl contact complex structure are all parallel. When is that the case? Well, not doesn't mean that the new house tensor has to vanish, but it has to be at least a totally skew symmetric tensor. In particular, zero is fine. And the vector field has to be killing. In particular, by the definition of alpha Sasaki, we see that this is the case. And then the formula for the torsion is extremely simple. It's D free form, basically, you would think of if you're being asked to write down a uh, free form out of the geometric data, T is equal to eta vetch to eta. And that this torsion has actually wonderful properties for alpha Sasaki manifolds was already observed in the 80s, much later, earlier than our work. Okay. Now, almost contact manifolds. So we have a manifold of dimension four n plus three with three almost contact metric manifolds. And basically I want them to be orthogonal. So one possibility is to read what I wrote here and the other way is to look at the picture. So you have three orthogonal vector fields, all of length one, C1, C2, C3. These are my three red vector fields. On each orthogonal plane, then you have this almost complex structure. Um, the mappings are such that if you look here, so there's a horizontal and a vertical space. The horizontal space is just the intersection of the corners of the eaters. And what I, we see here is actually only the vertical distribution. Right, which is spanned by the free vector field Xi12. And now the compatibility conditions are that the cross product of inside the vertical space of Xi1 and Xi2 is Xi3. So you have here Xi2 cross product with no, Xi1 with Xi2 goes to Xi3. And the concatenation of the endomorphisms phi 1, 2, 3 on the horizontal space um, just satisfy phi one times phi two is phi three, et cetera. And phi one maps 
to, to Xi3. So this is uh, again encoded in the picture. So you have Xi2, you have Phi1 and Phi1 turns that way and it will map Xi2 to Xi3. And this holds for all other pictures. So if you go into that plane, then Xi turning that way around, Xi3 goes to Xi1, etc. Hoping that, well, with the far parts you can't see. Okay, so that's also the arrows on the border which just tell you in which way you have to turn. Okay, the structure group then reduces even more, namely to SPN times identity on the horizontal space. So actually you don't see, you see it only on the vertical space. Okay, the manifold is going to be said to be hypernormal if all three neon house tensors are zero. And now here come some remarkable classes. We're going to call this a free alpha Sasakian manifold if each of these free almost contact structures is alpha Sasakian. Free Sasaki just corresponds to alpha equals to one. Free cosymplectic, for example, means that all three structures are cosymplectic. And there's also this nice no notion of free quasi Sasakian. Each of these is quasi Sasakian. Okay, so the main observation here is that we are not adding any new conditions on the relative behavior of the free single almost contact metric structures. We are just imposing structure for each single structure. Okay, and this is in fact something um, to look at. We are going to require some information about the relative position, so to say, of these free almost contact structures. Next observation is that in the free alpha Zazakian case, the manifold automatically has to be Einstein. And then a very nice theorem of Kashivara states that if you only impose the contact condition, so d eta equals two phi for each index i, then the manifold is automatically hypernormal. So whereas the two conditions are independent for Zazaki manifolds, they are not if you have the free almost contact structures. So this is a theorem we're going to keep in mind. Okay. Now, if you have three almost contact structures, you have in fact a sphere of them because if you have your three rib vector fields, then you have a sphere of course of radius one, which you can define by any linear combination of these vector fields. Okay, so xi, if I pick a point on the sphere, xi a is just the linear, this linear combination here, then I have the corresponding formula for the dual one forms, and I can define correspondingly a new um, endomorphism phi. And then this really defines a normal contact metric structure. Now, a theorem by Capuletti, Montano, De Nicola, and Yudin, relatively recent, says in fact that if um, the free almost contact structures are normal, then any contact structure in this sphere is going to be normal as well. Now, if you remember our theorem about existence of characteristic connection in the almost contact case, there we did not need the vanishing of the neon house standard, but actually that it is Q-symmetric. And so the first thing to prove is that if each single tensor field is Q-symmetric on H or on TM, then in fact, this is going to hold for all the endomorphisms which you get or all the contact structures you get from this associated sphere. Okay. So therefore, if we have an almost three contact metric manifold, if each of these contact structures admits a characteristic connection, the same is going to hold for every structure in the sphere, because this was one condition, and the other condition was that the killing vector, that the rib vector fields are killing, but the linear combination of killing vector fields is killing automatically. So this is an empty condition. Okay. Obviously, we can ask, are these connections the same? Is it going to be possible to find a metric connection with skew torsion, which is going to be nice with respect to all the structured tensor fields of all my free orthogonal contact structures? And unfortunately, a look at the Frizazaki case shows us quite rather quickly that this is not going to hold. 
because in the Frizazaki case, we know that the characteristic connection, if I just take one single Zazaki structure and forget about the other two, then for each of these, the torsion is eta i wedge to eta i. But in general, for Frizazaki manifolds, so for the three directions, since they are orthogonal, these three tensors are not going to be the same. And therefore, depending on which Zazaki structure you look, you get three connections, and, but they're not the same. So you need an intermediate, a weaker condition, which is going to look at all three contact structures simultaneously on an equal footing, instead of looking at one and forgetting about the others. Now here come two examples which show that this is not hopeless. Right, so examples which we knew before that such a connection exists and that it's reasonable to look at it. So the seven dimensional Fisazaki case is easier because you have the, um, well, you can look at it uh, from the direction of G2 geometry. So you have a different point of view. Okay, so if you just look at the free form omega, which I'm stating here, which is like a, a sum of all eta wedge to eta, plus a multiple of eta one, two, three. Then we realize that this defines a co-calibrated G2 structure. So as, as such, it admits a characteristic connection and its torsion is just as democratic as it can be. It's just the sum without any additional coefficients of the eta i wedge to eta i. Okay, just a sum. And one realizes that this connection has good properties because one, observes, it's going to preserve the horizontal and vertical distribution. The torsion is parallel, very nice property. And in fact, because it's a G2 structure, it automatically admits a parallel spinner, Psi. And this spinner is such that the Clifford products of this spinner with the free rib vector fields are exactly the three Riemannian killing spinners that any Frizazaki manifold has. So we have a generating spinner, this killing spinner, which geometrically from the Frizazaki structure generates the killing spinner fields. And maybe this is the answer to the question before how obvious they are. Okay, good. Here comes the second example where everyone can see something nice happens. So one looks at quaternionic Heisenberg groups. So I take such a, so that's basically all dimension four P plus three. And uh, I add the parameter for the metric lambda, which is positive. It's relatively easy to construct three contact metric structures on this Lie group. And in fact, they are going to turn out to be hypernormal, but not even free quasi Zazakian. And in fact, that's because none of the metrics in this family is even going to be Einstein, but free Zazaki would have to be Einstein. Okay. Um, in some paper, quite a few years ago already, we've proved that the naive candidate, namely to pick for T just to sum eta i wedge to eta i, which worked so nicely in the free Zazaki case, uh, is not going to work in this situation. Whether you have to take away this multiple here. And then you prove, just like experimental mathematics in some sense, that this is connection, a connection you should look at. Because, so the torsion is parallel as before, but not only that, the curvature is going to be parallel as well. And so, by Andrea Singer theorem, this is actually a naturally reductive homogeneous space. So the upshot is you find a good connection with Q torsion being metric, which is the Ambrosinger connection. The holonomy of this connection is nice, acting irreducible on vertical and horizontal distributions. And again, you have an induced co-calibrated G2 structure. Therefore, you have a parallel spinner field. And you can look again at the Clifford products of the Fourier vector field with that particular spinner field. Now, since none of the metrics on this space is Einstein, these cannot be killing spinners. But they exist and they seem to come in a natural way from the geometry. So the question is, okay, if they're not killing spinners, what are they? And the answer is they're generalized killing spinners. Can you generalized killing spinners basically one where the eigenvalue depends on the direction. 
Okay, so for a killing spinner, the spinner is, if you take the Levi-Civita derivative in a certain direction, just a multiple of the Clifford product of the vector field times spinner, and you see that you will just get different numbers here. That's the only thing to observe. Okay, so even in the non-Einstein and non fisasaki case, good connections exist, and a similar construction will yield interesting spinner fields generalizing killing spinners in a suitable way. Okay, now we know the metric cone, or we can also take it as a definition of a Frisazaki manifold is hyperkähler. The metric cone of the quaternionic Heisenberg group on the other side is a hyperkähler manifold with torsion. In some other work, at some moment, we worked out what are the conditions for the cone of a free contact metric manifold to admit a hyperhermitian structure and when it's going to be an HKT manifold. The criterion is clear, but finding a good class of manifolds satisfying the criterion was not. So a side result is going to be that we will have a large class of hyperkähler with torsion cones from our construction. Okay, so we want to find a larger class of manifolds with similar properties. This is not well posed, but I hope it will become clear. Uh, before I show you the main definition, are there any questions up to that point before I lose everybody? Whatever it is, and just be it, what is the weather outside? And the answer is it's not very nice. It looks like thunderstorm. Anything else? No, everybody went for coffee. Fine. Okay. So then here comes the class of manifolds. I want you I want you to take back home, or you're all already at home. So to take the message, this is an interesting class of manifolds. So a free alpha delta Zazaki manifold is an almost free contact metric manifold, such that just as in the Zazaki of alpha Zazaki case, d eta i is equal to 2 alpha times phi i, plus now an additional term which comes from the relative position of the free rep vector fields, or more precisely, their associated one forms. Because I add, so if i, j, k is an even permutation of 1, 2, 3 in direction 1, I add a multiple of eta 2 wedge eta 3. As before, alpha is real non-vanishing, delta can be any constant. Okay, so I am now assuming something about the relative position of these three almost contact structures, and that's the main change where things start to become interesting and you add flexibility to this class of objects. Free alpha Zazaki manifolds obviously just correspond to the vanishing of the second term. So this is normalized as alpha equal to delta and free Zazaki is alpha equals delta equals one. Quaternionic, quaternionic Heisenberg groups on the other side actually satisfy d e to i is equal to lambda. This is this metric parameter of phi i plus eta j wedge eta k. And so two alpha and delta are just parameters depending on the metric. It will turn out that the vanishing of delta has special meaning. And therefore, for the moment, we just take it as a definition and we see it in a minute why it's interesting. The structure is going to be called degenerate if the second constant delta is zero and non-degenerate otherwise. And the summary of quite a few pages of calculations is that by adding this extra term, you get a huge class of manifolds, but still nice properties. Namely, for every phi alpha delta Sasaki manifold, first, the structure is hypernormal again. So we get a generalization of Kashivada's theorem, which only treated the case alpha equal to delta. The distribution V is integrable with totally geodesic leaves. The free ray vector fields have to be killing, just as in the Zanzaki case, and xi i times xi j is actually twice delta times xi k. And here you see why delta 
the vanishing of delta is a special condition because it would then just mean that the three rib killing, well, the killing vector fields, which are the rib vector fields, are actually commuting. Okay, so delta really catches additional geometry. And in the Zazaki case, this is just not the case, right? They're not commuting. You have twice K here. Okay, there is an obvious, or there's a natural uh, notion of homothetic deformation for almost three contact metric structures which is given, so you have three constants, A, B, C, A is positive, C and A, B have to be related like that. You rescale the one forms, then you, re by the constant C, you rescale the rib vector fields by the inverse constant. The phi's stay the same and the metric is transformed with A and B, depending whether you are looking at the horizontal or vertical distribution. That's just what I'm doing here by adding this term. Right. And if you start with free alpha delta Sasaki and perform this homothetic deformation, then in fact you stay inside the class. It's going to be free alpha prime delta prime Sasaki again. And you can compute immediately the new values of the constants alpha prime and delta prime. Alpha prime and delta prime are the old constants alpha and delta multiplied here with C over A and here with one over C. Okay. <coughs> now, since A is strictly positive, this is allowed. Um, the class of degenerate class three alpha delta Zazaki structures in particular is going to be preserved because that was the condition delta equal to zero. So if delta is zero by homothetic deformation, you will always stay in that class. Furthermore, the sign of alpha times delta is preserved because C cancels out and alpha is positive. So the sign alpha times delta is always the same. And therefore we have now three classes. We have the degenerate case, that's delta zero. And then we have positive free alpha delta Sasaki manifolds just corresponding to alpha times delta positive and negative, well, guess what? And in fact, the proposition, which is easy, is that if and only if alpha delta is positive, then your manifold is going to be homothetic to a free Sasaki manifold, meaning, as we recall, that alpha equals delta equals one. And if alpha times delta is negative, then it's homothetic to one which doesn't have a name, which, but which is like the negative partner of free Sasaki namely alpha equal to minus one and delta equal to one. Okay. Now this Fuizasaki case is something we've seen before. So the obvious first question is, do they actually exist three alpha delta Sasaki manifolds with alpha times delta negative? Right? Because they cannot be obtained by homothetic deformation from this Fuizasaki case. So the answer is yes, and here is one construction. There's a certain notion of negative Fizazaki manifolds, which is a normal almost free contact manifold with a semi Riemannian metric of signature 3, 4n. And then everything as before, d e to i equals 2g times x phi i dot. It's just the usual condition. And if you start with a negative Fizazaki manifold, you change the sign of the metric here in such a way to obtain a positive definitive metric. Then in fact, this is free alpha delta Sasaki with exactly the constants we want, alpha equal minus one and delta equal to one. And it is known that quaternion Kähler, which are not hyperkähler manifolds <coughs> with negative scalar curvature are going to admit an associated principle as a free bundle, which is negative free Sasaki. These are the old works by Konishi um, from the seventies continued by Tang in the nineties. So we have a construction. It's not totally explicit. We will have more explicit examples later, but at least at that point we knew that this is not an empty class, which is always good if you introduce new definitions. Right? Okay. So condition bundles are examples or yield examples of negative free alpha delta Sasaki manifolds. Okay. Now 
here come the two, this hierarchy of good connections I would like to explain to you. And the idea is that first, so five compatible connections, as I mentioned first, are going to depend on, or going to be defined for any choice of almost contact structure on this associated sphere of contact structures, which comes along with my free contact manifold. So the notion of five compatible connection depends only on the choice of some one such point. And the main defining condition is going to be that, not that phi is parallel, that's too strong, but that nabla no phi in direction x, y is equal to zero for all horizontal vector fields. It turns out that such phi compatible connections do exist, but it's not strong enough to yield a unique connection. They will, are going to define, or, to, or they're going to depend, sorry, on the parameter function gamma. And we, we will see how this gamma appears. Obvious, uh, good advantages, they exist on very weak assumptions. Now, our notion of canonical connection. So first, it's going to depend on the whole almost contact structure. And for example, in the free alpha delta Sasaki case, you introduce a new constant beta, which is just twice delta minus two alpha. And we shall see why this number is interesting. Because the main defining condition is in fact that nabla x phi is some constant beta and not, again, not zero, but at least a linear combination of phi j and phi k and the coefficients depend on the vector field x. So in particular in the, horizontal, in the horizontal space, it's going to vanish and on the vertical space, it's given by that formula. Now, you know, in my online classes, uh, in order to activate students, I like to ask questions where the answers are given in the tutorials. So here comes the question, and the answer will come in a few slides, but just to stay awake, where have, think seriously where you've seen such a condition before. Okay, and you will get the answer quickly. Okay, um, so this beta is a priori a, constant or function even, which I would allow, I would just want to have such a condition. And um, then for three alpha delta Sasaki, you just check that that's what you get. Furthermore, one will see that such a connection now is unique because this parameter function gamma will then just be fixed to be that number. And in particular, we will see it exists on all three alpha delta Sasaki manifolds. Okay, so five compatible connections for the whole sphere of contact structures and canonical connection, fixing once and for all stuff by a stronger condition, this one compared to that one, right? This of course includes this horizontal vanishing condition, but it's here I'm not assuming anything about what's going on in the vertical space, here I am. Okay, now some details. So if I start with an almost contact manifold, I take fire structure in the associated sphere, then a connection is going to be called phi compatible if it preserves the splitting into horizontal and vertical distribution. Second, as stated before, on the horizontal distribution, the derivative phi vanishes. And the theorem you proof is the manifold is going to admit a phi compatible connection if the new house tensor is Q symmetric on H. That's in fact why this was a proposition like 20 slides before, and all xi i are killing. This is a special case of a more general criterion. See the paper. Phi compatible connections are in fact parametrized by the value of the torsion or the evaluation of the torsion on the free rib vector fields. Right? You see that by the geometric conditions, this object is just not fixed. These two conditions are not sufficient to be able to compute the torsion on xi123. That's why it's something, and a priori it can be any smooth function. Okay, so here are my connections. Now the canonical connection. We had seen before that assuming that all almost contacts, almost um, complex structures 
phi i are parallel is too strong. So we weaken it and suppose that NABLA preserves the three dimensional distribution of the endomorphism bundle spanned by the phi i. And this is just the same as the definition of a quaternionic connection. Okay. Except that on the quaternionic connections, you have any one forms here and there. And I'm assuming my one forms are just the one forms which come naturally from the geometry, namely the one forms dual to the rip vector fields. But besides that, philosophically, it's just what you would expect to do for a quaternionic connection. And so we put that into a theorem. If I assume this condition, then we see that such a connection exists. It is unique. It preserves the horizontal vertical splitting and the phi i are parallel along h. This connection is what we are going to call the canonical connection. And the function beta, in fact, which a priori could be any function, is just given by that number that I had stated in the summary before. So I'm not putting in that you can compute it in free alpha delta Sasaki case as before, but it's just a result. The canonical connection satisfies nice equations. You can compute, for example, the levi uh, sorry, the derivative under this connection for all structured tensors. And you see, not very surprisingly, that you're going to get a similar kind of linear combinations with, again, as a factor beta in front. Furthermore, if you define the fundamental four form as phi i wedge phi, phi one wedge phi one plus phi two wedge phi two and the same for phi three, then this is going to be parallel completely. You can therefore deduce something for the holonomy because you have lots of parallel tensors. And now you see that a particular case is the one when beta vanishes. So what we would call parallel canonical manifolds, right? Because if beta is zero, which is possible, um, then all structure constants are going to be parallel. Big fun. And in fact, the canonical connection just coincides with the characteristic connection of all these three almost contact metric structures if we view them separately. The point is just that for an alpha Zazaki manifold, um, beta is not, uh, sorry, for an alpha, yes, for an alpha Zazaki manifold or for a free Zazaki manifold, beta is just not zero because here you have delta minus two alpha, not delta minus alpha. Okay, so that's why looking at free Zazaki manifolds, uh, this observation that you have free contact structures which make all structure objects parallel was somehow hidden. One just hadn't looked at them before from this point of view. Okay. The metric cone, maybe we can go over that very quickly. Um, the metric cone of a free alpha delta Sasaki manifold, you check the criterion and realize this is an HKT manifold with nice properties and you can compute everything from the structure downstairs. So that's good. Okay, so here's a little overview about free alpha, de alpha delta Sasaki manifolds. So we have this parameters base, base alpha delta um, the degenerate case is the horizontal line. The free alpha Zazaki manifolds correspond to that diagonal. The free Zazaki case corresponds to that far point alpha equals delta equals one. The parallel case that we've just seen is another interesting line, but it's this red line here. And we have the positive ones upstairs and the negative ones downstairs. Okay. Oh. Questions? Everybody asleep? Okay, good. Right. So let's look, have a quick look at the canonical connection of the alpha delta Sasaki manifolds. Well, you can compute the torsion explicitly, and you realize that the torsion is again the sum eta i wedge to eta i plus a suitable multiple of eta one wedge eta two wedge eta three. And the multiple you have to put in front is exactly that. This torsion is to go, going to be parallel, whatever alpha and delta are. And in fact, you can prove that every free alpha delta Sasaki manifold admits an underlying quaternionic contact structure. And the canonical connection is in fact a quaternionic contact connection. Moreover, it's actually QC Einstein, which is a relatively recent notion. 
And this allows to determine the Riemannian Ricci curvature. So we have a full formula for the Ricci tensor, which looks like that. Now, if you look at that first side, it, so this is the Riemannian curvature, Ricci curvature. Okay, so you have here the metric and some coefficient in front. And here you have uh, the eta i of h xi i. Okay, so the vertical part with some other constant in front. The nabla ricci curvature can be computed as well. You get a similar expression. So philosophically, you have a block structure for both Ricci tensors with a certain eigenvalue on the horizontal part and another eigenvalue on the vertical part. And the eigenvalues can be computed explicitly. In fact, for example, one sees immediately that this Ricci tensor for the nabla uh, connection um, is symmetric which is in fact a condition which follows from the torsion being parallel because for metric connections which have torsion, the curvature is in general, the Ricci curvature is in general not a symmetric tensor. And now looking at the constants, for example, you can ask when is it Einstein, Nabla Einstein. So you see, for example, that it's going to be Riemannian Einstein just by doing, performing the computation on these constants in two situations, either alpha is equal to delta and this is just the old Fifazaki case, which of course we had to recover if everything is consistent, or delta is equal to 2n plus 3 times alpha. So there are Einstein manifolds not being Fifazaki in this large family worth investigating. The manifold is Nabla Einstein, which just means that the Nabla Ricci curvature is a multiple of the metric for a different condition namely delta times two minus n is equal to five times alpha. And you can ask when is it Riemannian Einstein and Nabla Einstein, and then you realize this happens only in dimension seven, and if delta is equal to five alpha. Quick computation. Um, and in fact, this happens for a compatible nearly parallel G2 structure. So it's not surprising as well, right? Every Frizazaki manifold admits by a certain kind of deformation uh, an associated nearly parallel G2 structure, and that's exactly the one we get here. Okay, I will tell you a little bit about spinners in the seven dimensional case. So, we had seen, so first you know that I love spin geometry. Obviously, and our second message is spinners are important for differential geometry. Okay, so in the seven dimensional case, where we have the additional advantage of G2 geometry for studying the manifold, um, we had seen that for the quaternionic, Kähler, quaternionic Heisenberg group and for Frizazaki manifolds, uh, there were nice spinners. So the question is how does this generalize? And the answer is any three dimensional, seven dimensional free alpha delta Zazaki manifold will again admit a co-calibrated G2 structure such that its characteristic connection as a G2 manifold coincides with the canonical connection that we have constructed without any reference to G2. And in fact, in any dimension, so in all higher dimensions, this detour to G2 geometry is not possible. Again, G2 is the stabilizer of a generic spinner in dimension seven. And therefore, this associated G2 structure will define a unique parallel spinner field psi naught on any free alpha delta Zazaki manifold. And this is what you're going to call the canonical spinner field. And then you get the qualitative result that we had on the particular examples before. Namely, the canonical spinner field is a generalized killing spinner. And it's going to be killing if and only if delta is equal to five alpha, which just means that you have a nearly parallel G2 structure. The Clifford products of this spinner field with the reprector fields are generalized killing spinners. And any two of the generalized killing numbers are going to coincide if the manifold is free alpha Sasaki. So we recover the known examples and a huge multitude of explicit 
generalized killing spinners in general. This is not totally surprising because for a co-calibrated G2 structure, this is an abstract theorem telling you that there exist generalized killing numbers, killing spinners. The funny thing is that you can construct them in an explicit way from the geometry. Uh, Ilka, how, yeah. how strong is, is to have this, this spinner harmonic? Uh, is, is too strong? Is it possible? This, this zero? Um, I deleted the formulas for the eigenvalues, but I... No, wait. The, just, hum, just harmonic. I would have to think about it. I didn't, uh, it's an easy calculation, uh, but I didn't do it. I don't know whether you are going to get, uh, I mean, you have four spinner fields here, right? This one is harmonic, it's harmonic because it's parallel. But the question is whether some of these could, for some nice values of alpha and delta, be harmonic without being parallel. Uh, probably the condition is that the trace of this uh, symmetric yeah, yeah, operator is zero, right? Right, but then you have just to check the numbers and see whether it's well, you can you have solutions. I just haven't because done the, the calculation. For a generalized killing spinner, the Dirac operator is just a multiple of it with a trace of the yeah, yeah. of the, the symmetric matrix. Just have to to compute the trace. I mean this is two lines, but two lines with a sheet of paper without everybody listening. But the numbers are exactly in our paper, so I just would have to do the trace, not making any mistakes because it's three eigenvalues. This is multiplicity two, one, four. So it could be, could be. Let me check afterwards, okay? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, the, the reason why I was hesitating was the following. Um, if you look into our paper with Simon Kiosi and uh, Thomas, yeah, uh, then we had these geometric conditions for unit length spinner fields being harmonic. But um, yeah, no, it, it takes five minutes, right? And we described which G2 structures can have harmonic spinners. So I just, it has to be compatible. Let's discuss it afterwards, but uh, it, it, this is a finite, finite problem. Okay, good. Now, in the last, well, five minutes, <clears throat> maybe I give, go over time, two or three minutes, I would like to tell something about some new results. And these are linked to two areas of, or circles of ideas. The first is the homogeneous case. And the second is, that we can use this nice new class of free alpha delta Sasaki manifolds as a toy box for studying strongly positive curvature. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the homogeneous case. So recall that we have a classification of homogeneous free Sasaki manifolds by Boyer Galitsky 1. Here they are. The case of projective space is somewhat awkward. So I will basically not consider it. But for all the others, you see that you have the known nice quotients and you have one which goes with each compact, simple Lie algebra. Very nice property. Okay. So this mimics basically the classification. And by work of Draper Palermo from Spain, um, we have a uniform description of these homogeneous spaces. So let me explain to you how this works. So they introduced the notion of Rizazakian data. That's a triple G, G naught H of Lie groups such that G is compact simple. H subgroup of G naught subgroup of G. <coughs> the Lie algebras satisfy that, okay, G naught is H plus SP1 where the H and SP1 factors are commuting subalgebras, G comma G naught defines a symmetric pair. The complexification of, so here G1 is just a complement of G naught inside G, but actually the complexification of G1 has the property that there exists some HC module 
W such that it stands a product of C2 yields exactly this Lie algebra. And uh, then finally, I let all this act on G1 by the action which comes from the action on W and C2 because well, they have an, an obvious C2 action. And then all in all, you have early algebra G, which has three factors, H plus SP1 plus G1. If you just look at G equals H plus, then you see that these two factors together will be a reductive complement M of H, whereas G naught corresponds to these two. And so this is going to be a vibration over the symmetric base G over G naught with fiber SP1. Uh, sorry, and uh, with a finding fi final manifold, furthermore is a vibration with fiber SP1. So to put that, more explicitly, I repeat here my manifolds. The subspace is SP1 and G1 here. If you look at G mod H, they will basically play the role of the vertical part, because that's three-dimensional, and the horizontal part in our free alpha delta Sasaki structures. And all that fibers over a compact or an onyx scalar symmetric space, which is just G over G naught. Okay, <coughs> so this is the idea. And then Draper Ortega Palomo proved that if you have such a triple G, G naught H, everything in such a way that it fits, then G mod H has a genome structure and you can define an inner product which is a rescaling of a suitable rescaling of just the negative killing form, kappa being the killing form, uh, on SP1 and G1 factors. Okay, and if you choose your numbers right, then this is going to be an Einstein metric. The CIs you define as being basically the standard basis of this vertical SP1 factor. And the endomorphisms phi i, which are just the almost complex structure in the orthogonal complement of the rib vector fields, are basically the adjoint action of the Xi. And then this defines a homogeneous Fisa-Zaki manifold. Conversely, every homogeneous Fisa-Zaki manifold is of this type except for this nasty projected space. So we have a uniform description. And the obvious question to ask is, can we do, play the same game to introduce alpha and delta? And can we get examples with alpha times delta negative? So the, since we know that every H homothetic deformation of Fisazaki will cover all positive homogeneous free alpha delta Sasaki manifolds, this works. So you start with these data as before, take, assume alpha times delta positive, and then you take the same construction, but you see highlighted in red where the constants alpha and delta have to be inserted. Here comes delta square, here you have alpha times delta, and since alpha times delta is positive, qualitatively this is going to be positive definite. Here we are scaling with delta, and here again. Okay, and then this is a homogeneous free alpha delta Sasaki manifold, and every such manifold which is not projective space is obtained by this construction. You can look at that and then you see quickly, for example, that this is going to be a naturally reductive homogeneous space if and only if delta is equal to two alpha, which is fine because we know that, for example, Fisa-Zaki is not naturally reductive. And this condition delta equal to two alpha, in fact, we knew before has a geometric interpretation because that was just this parallel case. Okay, so parallel being a property of the connection Whereas naturally reductive being a property of the homogeneous space, in fact, just turns out to be the same. Which in my point, from my point of view, just justifies that this is really a good connection catching the geometric properties of our spaces. Now you generalize all that to allow for the non-compact case. Okay, so instead of starting with a real simple Lie group, we take uh, of a compact simple Lie group, we take a really simple Lie group, everything else as before, and then G comma G naught is a compact symmetric pair, 
oh, sorry, if you, G comma G naught is a compact symmetric pair, then you obtain a generalized Sfisa-Zaki pair as described here by just taking the dual non-compact symmetric space, right? So you have with each compact examples we had before, we now have a non-compact, now a priori a non-compact setup of Lie algebras, and now you prove that it does the job. Okay, so by basically going to the dual um, data, you get non-compact generalized feasors data, and then on the quotient G star over H, just playing the same, but now with alpha times delta negative, then it all works. Because since it's non-compact, the killing form is positive, definite on one part, negative, definite on the other part. And the property that alpha times delta is negative just makes up this negative definite part. So all in all, this is going to be Riemannian. Okay, it's the same formula as before, but qualitatively different. And then right, look at the formulas, all works well, and you check that it all works. And then you get this table where you have here the compact group and the non-compact partner, the subgroups H and G naught and the corresponding dimensions. <coughs> ignore SP, ignore projective spaces. Okay, this is wonderful. We know that this is everything in the homogeneous positive case. Question, what can we say about the negative case? Alpha times delta negative. Are these all homogeneous such examples? And you think about it for a while, and for a while you think, yeah, probably that's going to be all. It's a very nice construction, works nicely. And then you realize, ah, but it, all that, all these spaces typically fiber over a quaternionic killer manifold. Okay, so maybe we should see whether we can cook up something by using non-standard quaternionic killer manifolds. And then you realize there's more. So the answer is no, this is not a complete classification in the negative case. And the idea is to start with homogeneous quaternionic manifolds as constructed by Alexeyevsky and Cortez in their very long series of papers. That's why I'm writing previous work subset of Alexeyevsky, Cortez, Alexeyevsky spaces alone, Alexeyevsky with Cortez, Cortez alone, so all subsets possible. And now if you've looked at these constructions, so that's basically you have a transitive solvable group of isometries, right? Then you'll see that this is a highly algebraic construction and not straightforward at all. So just explaining the construction and I'm not, I'm claiming that we in the last half year, we finally understood the construction. I'm not claiming we're experts on it, but so here's just a qualitative result. Yes, we get new examples with, by taking clever vibrations of a base, which is, for example, an Alexeyevsky space of negative scalar curvature. And you get examples which are not included in the previous construction. And the first such example actually, which is not covered by the previous theorem, occurs in dimension 19, written as four times four plus three. The difficulties are huge because first the construction is, hard, is complicated. Not all the examples constructed are positive definite. So you have to concentrate on the positive definite ones. Then you get, you have a lot of redundancy in these constructions. So you have to discard all the spaces you had caught before. And once you've done that, this, this depends on an abstract derivation, some super Poincare algebras, whatever. Um, then you try to give an explicit direct geometric description of the space without the detour of the general construction, because we're not interested in all, just in certain of them. Okay, I think I went over time five minutes as well. So I will just tell you, we have also in our backpack, we, are, we have a toy group of toy box of manifolds. There's this very nice notion of Strongly positive curvature as introduced by for first by Thorpe in the 70s and then continued by Zoltek and others, and then recently picked up again by Betziol and Mendes. And our idea was you see, this condition of strongly positive curvature depends on the four form. 
And this four form should have a geometric meaning. And we construct the four form out of the torsion of the canonical connection, proving that this is not some four form, which, you know, in Germany you say it falls from the ceiling, um, but it's really there in the geometry of the manifold. Okay. So the point is not to prove that certain manifolds are or have strongly positive curvature, not, but to prove it for a free for a four form which comes from the underlying geometry. Okay, and if you want to listen to that at some other moment, I'd be happy to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your interesting talk. <laughs> are there any questions? Uh, I have one question. Um, Ilka, uh, did I understood well that in the negative case, alpha delta negative, your mm -hmm. uh, the metric you construct is uh, pseudo Riemannian? No, 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 no. Your... Our metric is always positive definite. Okay, okay. Uh, but what was with this uh, pseudo Riemannian metric? What properties it has? What is Cortez construction or? Uh, no. no, the Konishi construction. Ah, you you yeah. start so, with a negative quaternion Keller. Yes. And so on the, the SO... construction, you get this negative Frizazaki. Yes. And, I may, and so what we're claiming is by performing a suitable change on a certain factor, <coughs> we construct a Riemannian metric and it's going to be free alpha delta Zazaki. Yeah. There was a slide before where your metric uh, uh, seems to have three negative directions. Maybe I. Uh, I Is that I'm the wrong, slide? Before yeah. that. No, but then she changed the signature in three in the, in the negative direction. Yes, I'm changing the thing. I'm changing the sign here because alpha delta is negative. Here, yeah, here, yes, yeah. but uh, on some slide before this one, uh, there was. I oh, know, but here's not a problem because here it's compact. Yeah. So yeah, alpha delta is positive, but here the killing form is negative definite. No, no, before, before that, when you talk about the Konishi construction, you know. Oh, that's long ago. Okay. Yeah. This one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What is... Uh, uh, here I changed the sign. Yeah. So the, what, what is called the negative Frizazaki has a pseudo Riemannian metric and yes. I make it Riemannian by this change. Ah, okay. Okay. No, no yeah, I, I agree. That, that's correct. Okay, good. And uh, maybe uh, uh, one uh, quick uh, second question. Um, wh why do you exclude the real projective space or the sphere uh, S4 n plus 3 uh, in the homogeneous. Uh, yes, because um, it's not covered by the construction. Here. So here you have this. So what Draper Ortega Palomo did is they found a setup covering in general all, yes. um, all spaces, but it does not fit for projective space. Now don't uh, that ask me those range, wrong. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it can be, you know, you would have to make it, I think it was connectedness, which was the problem here. And um, so you can, you can change it. No, no, I mean, they, you, you can adapt it, but it's, it's made in such a way that it will just cover this one additional case and it's not very nice. Because you can look at the sphere in several different ways as a homogeneous space and here probably the, you, you have to take a smaller Lie algebra uh, instead of looking at the sphere as SO4n plus 4 divided by SO4n plus 3. You have yes. to take yes. some SP groups, SPN plus 1 uh, and yes. something like that. Yes. So I, I'm, so I'm surprised that, that it uh, doesn't work uh, in this case. It doesn't case. work. No, it's, it, it's nasty. It's not okay. the problem. So we have the full description of projective space as well. It's just not covered by this description, but already in the paper by Drape Ortega Paloma, it's described how there to- There is not the same pattern. That's what you say. It's not you... exactly the same pattern, yes. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I see a hand from uh, Daniel Fang. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, uh, hi. Um, I'm wondering uh, how, uh, 
how much control exactly one has over the quaternionic scalar geometry on the base from the society geometry, particularly with view to non homogeneous examples? Um, so we do not have a, I believe, okay, no, I put it the other way around. You see, we took the heuristic approach, which is first to construct as many interesting examples in this large class of objects as before. Now, obviously, it seems to be that there's a meter theorem in the background saying that each free alpha delta Sasaki manifold, non-degenerate, right, is going to be a vibration over a quaternionic killer manifold. Mm -hmm. And I am very confident that this meter theorem is true. But for the non-compact bases and these non-negative stuff, you know, you see from these examples, it's more complicated than in the positive case and compact case. So it would certainly, there's a good deal of results about topology of Rizazaki manifolds, which then yields these vibrations and everything. And it's not a one-to-one -one translation into this case mm -hmm. because of this much larger class of examples. Right, which has to be covered by any meta theorems. So I think this would be an interesting question to ask. But before approaching such a thing, it was our goal to get interesting examples at hand. Yes, right. Yes, I understand. That, that's just how, how we proceeded. But the it next step is for us to, to do that. So I, I am, I um. In my PhD thesis, I think I s studied these structures from a different point of view in dimension seven, mm -hmm. um, from the point of view of invariant torsion of SO4 structures. Okay. Um, but the results, I think, you know, I'm not sure, just haven't watched this talk. I think it's the same structure in dimension seven. And I was able to get a local classification theorem, which is in the non degenerate case, it would always be this Kanishi bundle thing. Okay. I think um, I yeah. can tell you more about it in an email or something. Yes, send me an email. That would be wonderful. I so the reason know so, that so, yes wonderful just send it to me and then we will try to see um, how we can make things match together that would be interesting yeah, mm -hmm. cool. yeah. please good very good more input I be I'd be happy for any yeah, input maybe maybe I can continue if, if nobody wants um, I was wondering the reason why I was asking is because for these quaternionic Kähler manifolds. I mean, for these Alexevsky spaces, there is some theory of um, one parameter deformations of them. And uh, I'm working on this in my PhD thesis. And I'm wondering if someone, or if it's possible to somehow, um, for instance, get some theorem of the form if you have a Sasaki manifold which is uh, not homogeneous, the base is also a not homogeneous quaternion Kähler manifold. Yes. Uh, something like this. This would be very interesting. There's some and kind of control over the continuum. Yeah. Probably true, but one has to be careful. Um, so how do you deform? Well, uh, there's this, uh, um, well, this construction, which is it's called the one-book deformation for these uh, oh. metrics that arise from the CMAP. Yeah. And for these, uh, for instance, even for a symmetric space, the deformations can be quite interesting. And, yes. Uh, I would be interested in understanding what the corresponding results on the society. Great. Yeah. Could well be that there's a link there. I just don't know it, but if okay. you point me to the right things to look at, I'll be happy to, to try to, to see. And I will share it with, with, with Julia DiLeo, my co-author, and with um, Leander Stecker, of course. Um, and then we can see what we do. It's not completely... I, I wouldn't be completely surprised because this family of metrics, which is described here, appeared from a completely different point of view, for example, in a paper by Roger Bielowski, you know, which is more, was more looking at it from hyperkähler geometry. <coughs> and that in the background, so it, he, he, he just took the metric for his purposes. So, yes. Okay. Better. We shall see. Are there any other questions? May I ask some more questions? Uh, what about the zero case, the degenerate case? Do you have ex yeah, other examples, but the Heisenberg ones? 
Yes, we have some examples in our article, which are not, definitely not a complete classification. They're all homogeneous. And it's not so clear how large this class is. This is an open problem. We really don't know. But they are like a tor torus bundle over, over something, right? Yeah, probably. Yes. If we you take a hyperkähler uh, manifold and look at the three circle bundles given by the circle bundles with curvature, yes. um, each of the symplectic forms associated with hyperkähler manifold, I think you should mm -hmm. get an example with delta equals zero. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a question of time. So we haven't looked at the, you know, we constructed a few further examples. Uh, something like that should work, but we haven't done it so far. No time. Busy with Alexeyevsky spaces in these things and a few other, and this positive, strong, strongly positive curvature business also. Which I think adds a nice touch to that area of, of topics. Anything else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, could you tell us about, a, a bit about this uh, Thorpe trick uh, with strongly positive curvature? Yes. So, I apologize for all the others. I will just go to the slides I had prepared. Okay. So, right. So, here I just recall what the definition is. Okay. So, I view the Riemannian curvature operator as a symmetric operator on two forms. Right. And so strongly positive curvature means that there exists a full form omega such that the Riemannian curvature plus omega is going to be positive definite in every point. And this was introduced by Thorpe because um, very two plane. Now you can compute the section of curvature and you realize that if the Riemannian curvature is strictly positive or non negative, then you will be able to conclude about positive or non-negative sectional curvature. And in dimension four, in fact, that's basically an if and only if condition. And so obviously here in this definition, you see it depends on this four form. And geometrically, it's not so clear what the meaning of the four form is. And so after reading the paper of Pizzol and Mendes on strongly positive curvature, where one sees that many of the homogeneous examples are exactly free alpha delta Sasaki manifolds. The question was, can we understand the four form geometrically in the context of the underlying geometry? That's how we started in the business. So on a free alpha delta Sasaki manifold, we take the curvature operator, in fact, both curvature operators, the one for the Riemannian curvature and also for the canonical connection. And because the torsion is parallel, this is really going to be a symmetric operator. This is a non-trivial statement. And then you see that the, if, for example, the four form omega would be minus one fourth sigma t, where sigma t is a four form, which is basically up to a normalization, um, the exterior derivative of the torsion, so dt, okay? So if you have a free form T given, then DT is certainly a natural four form to look at. There's also an algebraic description of sigma T. So sigma, if you're dealing with connections with skewed torsion, right? This DT and sigma T, they appear everywhere. So this is an, if you ask anybody working in the area and so, so I tell them, you give your canonical connection with skewed torsion, give me a four form, this is the four form they will give you, okay? So this was a natural candidate to look at. And the observation that this difference is just the canonical curvature operator plus a difference tensor, which comes from the torsion in this way, you see that it's going to be strongly non-negative with this full form, even only if this operator is non-negative. And so what you get as a theorem is you take a homogeneous free alpha delta Zazaki manifold which comes from our construction of these generalist data. So it does not cover Alexeyevsky spaces and these crazy things, okay? And then you can read off the sign of alpha delta, what happens with the sign of the canonical curvature operator. 
And then you can conclude what happens for the Riemannian curvature operator. So a positive homogeneous free alpha delta Sasaki manifold is going to be strongly non-negative with this full form, if and only if alpha times beta is larger equal to zero, where beta is the factor we had before. So that's what you get qualitatively, right? If you, if you give me your manifold and say it's alpha free alpha delta Sasaki and alpha equals delta equals, I will be able to tell you whether or not it's strongly non-negative or even strongly positive, but that's a different question, just from the numbers with respect to that full form, right? This should be repeated all the time. And, uh, but I think it shows that this connection has useful applications outside the theory, holonomy theory of this kind of connections. And here's just a summary of some examples. And then you can also make it a little bit better by adding some epsilon constants to have strongly positive. Great. Does that answer the question approximately? Um, well, how necessary is the homogeneity here? <laughs> Um, we have also some results for non-homogeneous, but the curvature operator is, of course, easier to control under that assumption. So for homogeneous case, we have our curvature operator in just as explicit way as we want. And there are some curvature parts which are harder to control in the non-homogeneous case, but we get some partial results there as well. Are these homogeneity one examples? Uh, no, it's not. It, it, no, it's just uh, what we, we're just looking at all curvature components we can control without further homogeneity assumptions. So just saying, okay, Almost. any free alpha delta. And then, yeah, at some moment you have to assume something about the submersion to the base, but um, it's, it's, you get quite a lot, but strongly positive is difficult, but non-negative is easier. All right, so I, I will propose we continue the discussion during the coffee break, if that's okay for everyone. And let me thank Ilka again for a very nice talk. You can open your mics and clap with me if you want. Mm -hmm. Thanks all for listening. Thank you, and